Good morning and welcome to the New Collective podcast. This morning, I am having a lovely conversation with Rose Perry, and she is going to talk to us all about her practice, her artwork, and her artistic journey. Welcome to the podcast, Rose. How are you? Very good, thank you, everyone. Hello. <laughs> I, I'm delighted to have you here and to, to chat with you about your work, um, as you are our feature artist for the um, end of March and to the beginning of April. So for some reason, we've decided to to start in the middle of a month and finish in the middle of a month um, and uh, <laughs> between the, the month features. But it's great to have you. You're going to be showcasing your work all through St. Patrick's Day into the Easter period. So looking forward to seeing some new work up on the collectives page. And um, and now we're going to just talk a little bit about you. So, Rosa, tell us, can you remember your first memory of what you created when you were a kid? What was the first thing that inspired you as an artist? Well, I think that um, I was surrounded by objects and also um, very influenced by my parents' very humble background. Um, but my dad, in his uh, free time, which was very little, uh, he would always be making things, apart from his repairs, he repaired the uh, weighing scales. And, uh, but he would um, make things out of objects. And for example, he was he, he loved snorkeling and used to collect the little leads, you know, the fishermen put on the, mm -hmm. on the, on the rod uh, for waste. And he would collect them from the bottom of the sea. And then he would make lovely little chains with them and the walls and he was forever making things. And uh, my mom was a great seamstress. Uh, she didn't work as a seamstress, but she had educated herself as a seamstress out of need. Um, at the age of 12, she made her sister's uh, communion dress. They they had very little, and so they had to all, you know, work and help at home. Um, but other than that, my dad was also like a, an avid collector and, and an avid reader. And that also went together because he would collect objects that had uh, cultural and social meaning uh, and historical meaning. So there were crafted objects mostly like oil lamps or little vessels for coal to warm up your feet when you, you know, uh, in the old times they put it under the table. So we had all these objects which were crafted and um, scattered around the house, weighing scales, which he worked with and he loved the old ones, weights, um, and then he had other collections um, like stamps and shells and coins. And so um, uh, I, I was mesmerized by all these things. I'm very, very uh, excited about every little bit that had some bit of information. And I used to want to make things myself with these things. And I have this memory, I must have been very, very small, um, I was looking at my dad's collection and there were tiny little, little shells, mm. uh, tiny little like scargolins, you know, from the sea. And I said, I want to make something. So he said, oh, come to the garage and we'll see. So he gave me a hammer and a tiny little needle. <laughs> and on the floor of the garage, he showed me how to put a little hole <laughs> in the shell and feed it through a uh, fishing cod. And I made myself a necklace that was Oh wow! I still have it, actually. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I I always wanted to make things. Other things that I wanted to make, I don't know. I used to go out when the electrician um, would repair something in the street, and they would leave these kind of um, knots of thread, you know, of of plastic uh, covered um, um, metallic thread, and mm -hmm. I was I would strip it and coil it and make little rings and bracelets. <laughs> um, we, we had no means and we had no activities. So, yeah. you know, we just went to school and back home and I was forever bored and trying to do things, always anxious. Yeah. And I even remember saving earth to try to make my own clay. <laughs> yeah, wow. Yes. So you were very, you were very re resourceful, Rosé. <laughs> <laughs> Just out of need, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. 
But it's great. It's great to see how you were making such a small age and like and how inspired you were by your parents and their and their ability to make. Of course, that's a, such a great foundation for your art practice. Yes. And, what, and when you went to school, did you get where, what was it like in school? Did you do any sort of creative learning in school or was it what was that experience like? Yeah, school was very good because it was quite uh, it was a very mother again, a very poor neighborhood. Um, but the the director i think she had a vision of of what would give children an opportunity you know and try to explore different things so so the art class which was one of my favorite it, it was also very um resourceful with very simple uh, materials but we would make things out of we would melt wax candles and we would melt wax crayons <laughs> and drip them and, and you know at the time uh, people were not very worried about insurance so we were very experimental that way uh we would have clay clay yes every now and then we were given clay and that was precious to me you know put my hands in the clay um so yeah our class i remember it as being quite uh, exciting uh, mm. Yes, and then later on in in secondary school we had a very good art and design teacher Mm. We did, one of the options was our design and graphic design, mm. all in one. Yeah. During two, two or three years. And I loved it. And I remember being encouraged by the teacher saying, you, you should, you know, you should uh, persevere in this subject. And um, we had a very, very interesting, I suppose this was very, very, a very important point in my life. Um, in I think it was uh, 1981. There was a coup d'état, and if you know, you know, in Spain we had had a dictator for 40 years, and then we had we were out of the dictatorship only five or six years, and uh, we had a coup d'état, which was a one-day scare. And my secondary school, which was a the public village or town secondary school. Um, mm-hmm decided to stop all teaching and dedicate a week to um, get activities together uh, for peace. Mm -hmm. And and they even um, invited Rafael Alberti, which is a a very, well, was a very, very uh, prominent uh, poet and also painter Mm -hmm. in Spain. I don't know, some some of the, I I guess, some of the literature teachers know him Mm -hmm. and they invited him over and we did this mural of the Guernica because he came to talk about peace and all the artists that had a, a say in the peace process um, during the dictatorship. And one of them was Picasso. So he was friendly with Picasso and he, and we put this mural out of the Guernica. We did it by pencil because, you know, it's black and white. Mm. And we actually drew it by pencil, a group of us. <laughs> and we okay. also, Yes, it was it was a, an amazing week. He came then and talked to us. It was almost like if George Orwell came to yeah, absolutely. the Lion Community School, exactly the yeah. same. And, uh, how how wonderful for you to be exposed to that at that it age. It was fantastic. It was oh, fantastic. Wow. We had a, an art um, uh, contest, which I participated to, to to decide who would who would do the cover of the poetry book, which was another contest that we run along the week. And I won the prize and well, that was like, you know, that somehow that was a turning point for me. <laughs> yes. Not, not fully a turning point because at the time I was very excited about many, many things. The same way I was, you know, excited about this process, about literature, about, um, I, I love philosophy. I, I, I was, uh, excited about many 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 learning processes yes you were um, an academic <laughs> trying to find out your where you were to go in a way I, an explorer perhaps explorer, you know yes, and so yes, I, yes. somehow i diverted academically for a while as well yes. yeah. but what just what an amazing um experience for you in school to be able to be exposed to those artists and to have an opportunity while obviously the circumstances were not ideal so far as what was happening in the world at the time but I suppose having the opportunity to to meet with these people and to create something together as a collaborative is, was as well as amazing. And then to get the 
the um to get the validation i suppose of of winning your your award as the book cover what a great what a great kickstart to your career yes i think well at the time i think that being an artist perhaps it wasn't an option yeah because of well because i was very aware that i you know i came from a modest background you know not very resourceful and that somehow was more of a dream than yes. a career that i would dare to pursue mm. but he was very encouraged by that teacher himself his name was tashido he was uh, he was like an architectural designer as well he works in... wow. so what uh, what made you decide to go down the route of the artistic pathway oh. well it's funny because at the time as i had all these different interests um, yes uh, and my interest was perhaps like a perceptive col cultural, social, and also, you know, representative. So it, all in my brain, you know, it was, I was very interested in artistic uh, representations. I, I used to stay up at night um, reading reports about films I had seen, you know, like there was a club like a cinema club on TV, you know, we always had one or two channels at the time, uh, but this cinema club on Fridays uh, would show uh, uh, films of Truffaut and Herzog and all these different um, directors, different different type of film. And so I was interested in all the things and the world out there. Uh, I love the languages and I wanted to learn more languages so that I could get out in the world and explore. And it came to then the end of secondary school and I had to decide what to do, what to do. Um, all along I had this love for nature mm. and love for um, animals. And you know how coming from, from a place where jobs were very defined, uh, people had said to me, oh, you should be a vet. <laughs> um, because the art was almost, it was not seen as as a career a career yeah uh, and i almost didn't dare to put that out but mm. anyway i thought well okay maybe i should be a vet because i love animals and I mm. love nature uh so when it came to the end of, of secondary school i got quite good marks and i thought well you know so i'm gonna apply to be a vet because it was quite difficult to get so i'm gonna apply to be a vet but then something was pulling me towards the arts as well. Mm -hmm. So at the same time, I also went to do the, um, the entry exam for the art school. And it was a, an, art, an exam which was totally apart. Well, you needed to pass your living cert, but you also yes. needed to do this entry exam. And naively, I went to do this test without no preparation other than the little bit that I had done in secondary school. I remember going into the place, architecturally quite fantastic, but full of tables and plinths and, and materials, and I'm feeling completely overwhelmed. <laughs> and then surrounded by these other students that had been into classes with this and that artist, and I, oh, I just panicked. <laughs> panic um we were given three days to make something mm -hmm. um i tried to make I, I i designed something similar to what i had done for the cover i i, I won the prize for mm. but my gouache uh, pigment run uh, run wrong <laughs> i couldn't fix it and i panicked i went home i waited for a day i went back to the exam to finish it, I thought I might finish. I knew at that time I had spoiled it and I knew I wasn't going to get in at mm -hmm. the time. Um, and I proceeded with veterinary for a year. <laughs> wow, so you went, you, you, went to, you went to vet college then? I went to vet college for a year and all along thinking, this is really not for me. Okay. Um, so I started uh, studying languages at the same time, mm -hmm. at night. And by the end of the year, I thought, this is where I am happy with the languages. At the mm. And it was perhaps one of the most difficult times in my life, funny enough, because 
it was a, a defeat of um, a defeat of a purpose, like um, letting myself down, letting my family, even though I didn't have that pressure. And I must say, my family never pressurized me to do one thing or the other. Mm. But I was very, very um, let down in myself for having to stop when I had started. <laughs> um, and I suppose that's always been with me, you know, um, say that I will do something, think I will do something and not being able to finish it or it is really distressing, you know, <laughs> so, yeah. um, almost promising myself something and not being able to, to yeah. fulfill yeah. Yeah. the promise, yeah. you know. That's part of, of who I am, I guess. So you went to, to lang you studied languages and from languages, what did you do with that course? So did you did you pursue any sort of work with that? Yeah, the languages um, I did, I did uh, for years of different languages and I had th that um, brought me to different places and exploring a little bit the world. Um, doing different courses to practice mm. the languages. And eventually I decided that I, I started working at the same time. I was working full time um, just with my languages as a PR for, for a, a chemistry, for a um, pharmaceutical company, mm. uh, but always studying at night um, with, with the idea of my dream, you know, going exploring. And um, I, I suppose at that time, the art was a little bit left out other than what I could see or the books that I could read and some mm. exhibitions, not many happening in my hometown. There was a museum which was built. Well, there is still a museum which is built on top of uh, Roman baths. And I used to go there to spend time every Friday by myself, <laughs> walk in the baths and, and look at all the objects that were made by the Romans and the mosaics. And that was like a little paradise. Like mm. I remember the feeling of... Um, excitement and fulfillment and uh, so there were my little you know moments where I could relate to that artistic world but mm -hmm. other than that working full-time studying at night and um, eventually I decided that it was time to go and learn a bit more with the languages and I I moved to Ireland I left my job and I came to Ireland uh, <laughs> what made you move to Ireland I think basically that that need to to go exploring and mm. the need to see how people live in other places, mm. uh, um, go experience life differently. And so, what brought you back into your artistic world? Because you obviously do a lot in design now, but where was how long did it take you to get back into it? What was what it triggered you back? It took me a while because um, after a while of being in Ireland, I got uh, a job teaching. Um, I was always thinking, I, I, I really wanted to get back to art, and um, my studies brought me to to the states to do some research. And at the time, the research that was offered to me was it was part of a like a PhD program and it seemed ideal to me I would be able to go and finally research what I wanted which was uh, intercultural communication which my, my subject uh, but then I realized when I was there I was in Los Angeles um, and I, I, I realized I, I, I couldn't find really what I really wanted to do there because the, the vision that I had about um, researching people and how they communicate and, and why they miscommunicate uh, it wasn't shared by by the program that was offered and I had to make the decision then to stay or go further exploring in the states or, or come back to Ireland and when I came back to Ireland my job here was gone for a few months they they said it would be back you know at the beginning of the year at the academic year so I said well I'm I'm just going to use my time to do art courses. And I started doing art again at night. You know, they were community art courses mostly. I did an intensive course in sculpture and photography in the Crawford, which was just the summer kind of, yeah. you know, it was not for art, art students. It was just for people that wanted to explore photography and sculpture. And that really brought me back into it. I thought, I'm back. This is not what I always wanted to do. 
but of course, um, well, the opportunity came then. Um, I finished my research work. I uh, and then at that level, the jobs were not coming along, uh, mm. and I was a bit frustrated with that. That all my my jobs were, even though it was full time, it was seen as a part time uh, lectureship. And uh, mm. you know, discontinued in the summer with no. Um, I was a bit frustrated, you know, that, all, yeah. that my level of expertise wasn't being used. And then uh, I thought I would give myself a year truce. And I I went into um, Stefanefa. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody advised me, if you if you really want to see if, if you can do this, you should do a portfolio course and explore if you can really get into the world of art. So I did that year in Stefanefa, which was fantastic year for me uh, an eye-opener and it got me back feeling and seeing and thinking about the vision and and design and um all the concepts of 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 why am i making and how do i feel and how do i portray what i feel it, it was a fantastic year it was wow. Yes. wow it's you're you're the way you're speaking about this is kind of i would say you'd encourage anyone to go and pursue pursue the art practice if it was something that they had ever thought about doing or ever kind of dreamed of to, to just do it i must say i i miss the teaching very much because i was passionate about it yeah I, I was passionate about this this concept of intercultural communication and and um yeah people getting together and understanding each other and you know mm -hmm. but um and and yes I, I love my report for the, with the students I I really cherish that and I missed it for a while mm -hmm. uh, but then again I had my art world and I met some fantastic people people of all ages especially in Stephanie the mm -hmm. ranges of ages I, we had fantastic friends you know we made great friendship with 16 year old students that had just come out of secondary school and not mm. quite you know done the living center but exploring other avenues and then we, there were some retired people which had the vision that people that had always wanted to do the yeah. art and, and you know uh, they hadn't been able to so that was very enriching and mm. that course then allowed me to apply um, for the Crawford College of Art and yes. um, I, but before I applied to college, uh, I had a great opportunity to meet uh, Michael Quayne. Uh, we had to do uh, work experience in Stefanefa mm. and decide what subject we wanted to explore. And I was, sculpture was, after that course I had done in, in the summer, that intensive course, I, I knew sculpture, three dimension, everything with three dimension mm. making. And, um, I, I mentioned to Lucy Pillen, who was the coordinator, I said, well, there are two things that are very much at my heart. One is stone sculpture, and the other one is uh, jewelry, uh, silversmithing, because for me, silversmithing was miniature sculpting. Uh, in the way I, I, I understood jewelry, and, and traditionally in my culture, jewelry would always be there, you know, as a celebration, you know. Yes. Especially, I suppose, because of a mother's background, you know, jewelry meant a lot. Little yeah. jewelry pieces uh, to mark different uh, stepping stones. And so that was a, the cultural, I suppose, Arabic culture at the, at the end of it. And um, so those two things were at my heart, my passion, the jewelry and the sculpture. So she said, oh, well, I went, I went to school with Michael Quinn. Would, would you like to give him a call? I was like, oh. <laughs> my yes. <goodness. laughs> yes, please. <laughs> yes. So is, she said, oh, yeah, look him up in the, in, in, the, in, the, in the telephone book. He's there, he said. She said. <laughs> so after calling about three different Michael Quinns, of course, I got the spelling with my you know, with my linguistic mix up, <laughs> I got the wrong spelling for Michael Quayne and I, I called three different Michaels. Mm. One of them who happened to be uh, 
acquainted to Michael and gave me his telephone number to score his foot. And he said, oh yeah, come to my workshop. He he was based in a creamery, mm. building an old creamery. He said, come to the, come to the creamery and, and I'll show you around. And, you know, I, I don't have a lot of time. I, I won't be able to do this every week or whatever he said, but come along and, and I'll definitely show you. So yes, that was a great, great experience. He, wow. he was incredibly kind. I, I remember showing me how to work the, the pressure hammer um, mm. for carving. He was doing a big sculpture and he was very, very busy trying to finish that, but he gave me a, a cutting of his sculpture, like a bit wow. of rock, uh, Kelly limestone. And he said, here, make, make something with this. So he showed me how to work the pressure hammer and he showed me around his different tools, who, which most of them he had made himself. And uh, he said, we, we have to get you a little bit of uh, protection gear. So he said, look, you work away in the stone and, and I'll go and get you protection gear. So he went off to the co-op, it was just a few minutes away, and left me with a pressure hammer. And after a while, <laughs> with a pressure hammer, <laughs> but I hadn't asked him how to switch it off. <laughs> oh. You know, the pressure hammer. <laughs> 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 and bits going everywhere when the protective gear he didn't even have yet. <laughs> so he came back with a mask and a mump, you know, um, a mouthpiece, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Very kindly. He wasn't taking any money for it. He said, You're not your student now, you cannot, you know. He was really, really kind. And obviously his work to me fantastic. You know? Yes. Did you have did you have a long time with him then in the end after all of that? I some days, you know, maybe every week or every two weeks, I go and spend a couple of hours. Uh, sometimes I just ask him, "What can I do? Can I help you with something?" And I would just yeah. really clear the rock that he was chiseling away, or everything was to me important, you know, just to see him. He would explain how how he was managing to lift the pieces, for example, yeah. because that's part of when you're doing heavy sculpture. Yes, the logistics is what takes the most thought. Yeah. Um, and one of the reasons why I don't do much uh, stone sculpture anymore because, uh, well, you know, it, it, it takes its toll. <laughs> it does, yeah. So I, I, that's so when you went to you finished the Stephen Afer and you and you went to the Crawford, and how was your experience in the Crawford? What did you did you did your work change? Did your ideas change? Did your process change? How did you get on there? Uh, my first year in the, in the Crawford was a really interesting and really inspiring and uh, very encouraging. Um, we had two teachers that used to do the rounds together, uh, Bill and Jill, and um, uh, sorry, uh, Brent, Brenda and Jill, and um, they they looked at everybody's work. We were in a big room, all of us, maybe 50 of us. And little by little, they placed people in different spaces to give them a different sense of where they were and what they were doing. And, and that was, to me, a, a great move. I remember them placing me in this, this kind of little room out of, out of the space, but still in the space mm. uh, with another, um, uh, student who we are life friends now and then you know moving us back again with the group and that that gave us a lot of sense of who we were with what other people were doing and how yeah. we were thinking and so it was very very enriching very enriching and then we had loads of um, different materials to experiment with Mm -hmm. uh, coordinator Harry, he would push us away from from the, our little space into the uh, ceramics room. Go, go now! There is a space in the ceramics room. Go, go, see the opportunity. Go the sculptor yard. Go to the, I, forever saying, what, what what am I be able to go to? What am I going to be able to to work with stone? <laughs> <laughs> oh well, well, we'll get there. We'll get there. So eventually, I remember going out to the yard and uh, meeting Peter McTighe, who was a, the sculpture teacher there. And uh, 
saying to him, I, I really want to give it to go. I really want to give it to go, but I am not really allowed. <laughs> You just come down and I'll show you, I'll give you some tools and just come. So you forever nicking out of my space to go to uh, to stone uh -huh. carving. Um, I also remember going to the technician uh, room where he was providing with different tools and different materials and and he was working himself in, in his space while mm -hmm. he was providing the students, doing his own thing and he was doing this this uh, figurative work, which was a sculptural, with layers and layers of metals. And one of them was lead. And I thought, oh, this is fantastic. This is like, you can bend these, you can mold it, but it's metal. <laughs> and so I started experimenting. That was my first um, go at Repousse. He was very, very kind. He, he made me the molds in wood so that I could actually work with the lead sinking it and pushing it and bending it. Um, so yeah, it was very fortunate. That first year was fantastic. And then well, little by little, then it, it became a bit more complicated in the Crawford. It was, uh, it became a bit more complicated, different, different issues, I suppose, going on in the school. Sculpture became like a second thought a little bit. Mm. Um, so it was harder and harder to to hold on to the sculptural work and to focus on the sculptural work, but I, I, I was stubborn. <laughs> what, what were you, what were you making then when you had to go through a second, through fourth year? Uh, we were experimenting a lot with doing a series of um, studies. And so the studies, we were, we were given freedom to experiment with different materials. And I, most of my work was was three dimensional, and I would experiment with different materials, meshes, um, copper, brass, rods, um, um, but also with with clay and ceramics, and uh, so combining those and knowing how to build that ceramics um, sculpturally so that they wouldn't collapse, and so it was a lot a lot of learning. Um, the projects were always towards some sort of um, end of term, maybe exhibition where we had to develop a concept. Sure. Um, and I was very, very taken then by by figurative work. Um, I had always believed that I couldn't draw or um, represent in two dimensions. Uh, figurative or mm. natural work and yeah. um, I, I I learned to do it in Stefan Effa. I learned to see and to put in paper what I could see and whenever somebody says to me oh I cannot draw I said like there's no such thing as I can not draw because one has to learn to see before one can draw mm. and I, I must say I owe that to Stefan Effa. So then I explored a lot about figurative figurative work, but it was the body, the body, the body. I was really taken by the shape of feet and the function of feet. And so I did a lot of studies about feet, lots of drawings, lots of representations of feet, shoes around feet. <laughs> um, a very smelly period for you. <laughs> yeah, it was very smelly. <laughs> and uh, then... I suppose at that stage of my life, um, I was late twenties. Um, I started thinking about um, family, um, mm -hmm. the way that it, it, my relationship evolved, and and I started thinking about uh, pregnancy and um, that figurative world of pregnancy and the body and how the body struggles with it and what it means that the body is pregnant and what it means to be a woman and what is expected and uh, all these ideas, you know, of the clock ticking and <laughs> and not really believing it, but being a little bit caught in it. And yes, I did a lot of uh, figurative work, but distorted wholesome bodies, bodies embracing functional shape, you know, natural, almost 
earthy, stony shapes. And, mm. uh, um, and my work started evolving, my, my, um, my sculpture work started evolving that way, the, the woman, how is it expected to be portrayed and how, how are you expected to move your body, but how do you really move your body? Uh, when you are at work, on uh, when you are holding something, or where you're washing your hair, or when you are, you know, picking something from the ground, you know, and all those ideas of, of stereotypes about we women's bodies. We're very and, much into the mechanics, by the sound of it, of that. Yes, but also the stereotypes, you know, like ladylike, not ladylike. What's ladylike, and why? And I, can you be ladylike if you're a mother? <laughs> uh, all that uh, process and from that well funny enough at the end of the first year in the Crawford I became pregnant um, and then all of a sudden <laughs> my world changed because I was deep 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 into the, the art world and the design world and sculpture and everything that I took and everything every step that I took was seeing something Everything I looked at, I could see something. I could see mm. a shape that I wanted to portray and put down in paper or in clay or in stone. And then I became pregnant and I had to rethink of how am I going to do this? But also it then started questioning all the issues about the body and what was expected. And then it developed into almost a fear, a fear between being able to do and not to do, but also being able to protect and not protect. Yeah. yeah. I became a mother artist and I was like really at odds with all of it. Mm. Um, and it was a very struggling time in my life. Mm. And I think you can see that in my, in my sculpture, my stone sculptures, basically, mm. which were all about the humanity of, um, bringing somebody to the world and the worries and the fears and also the lack of freedom, yeah. uh, you know, to develop one's mind, you know, freely. It is yeah. just, just not possible anymore. Yeah, you had a little one to look after. <laughs> yes, <laughs> which I couldn't carve with, for example, <laughs> I cannot oh, be no. holding a pressure hammer next to baby. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> stick quiet there for a minute I need to do this little piece <laughs> the poor child and when your child was born did you um take a break from Crawford or did you continue through it or did you how did how did that all happen yeah no um I didn't take a full break I I did uh take just a few um what would you call and now they're called credits, but then it was just a few subjects. So, yeah. yes, the, my first year, I guess I did all the the written work in all the projects and the research. And I kept I kept drawing and I kept trying to make things at home, mm -hmm. um, going in maybe once a week to to still tip in, you know, into my um, yeah. into my photography and to my um, foundry because I did photography and foundry at the same time as, than stone carving as uh, secondary subjects uh, so those had to be ticked in you know and so you got through your 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 degree program and now you're out and you're making work and how long, when when did you finish your degree in 2005 okay so you you graduated some time now have you did you have you now seen a change in your work from then to now? Yes, um, yes, very much because um, I had to rethink, you know, my, my stone sculpture work became almost an impossibility um, because I prioritize family all the time, basically. And, uh, um, and I have no regrets about it, but I had to, um, rethink of how am I going to do my work um, just being able to just nip in and out you know and uh, so That's I started nice. thinking about jewelry again and how jewelry could be for me that sculptural miniature uh, representation of my you know to carry on my sculptural work so I started training um, with uh, in St. John's uh, school 
I did silversmithing um, one night a week with this fantastic, fantastic uh, mentor, Chris Carroll. And uh, everything I know about silversmithing really I owe to him. Uh, I've done some other courses. Uh, but um, yes, he was very accommodating and very um, helpful. Uh, and I little by little got more and more and more into that world of a silversmithing and making jewelry. Uh, so back to my like childhood dream <laughs> of doing that, and that obviously triggered your, your jewelry, your jewelry business, I suppose, as well as as your your jewelry art practice. Yes, yes, yes. It, it's a small business because I I still you know I still go with the family first most of the time. So I I, um, I don't push it very far. Uh, I push it within my limits. Yeah. Um, I always um, enjoy commissions that have some sort of vision. I love working with people personally, and and jewelry has allowed me to do that to keep contact with people. I I think sometimes art is is very lonely, and uh, being in your studio, okay, you might have your music and and your phone and your messages, but it's really lonely. Sometimes it's really daunting. Um, and it's only by contact with others that you your your brain sometimes bounces into more creativity, and I yearn for that. And and the jewelry has allowed me that that contact with people, you know, and also the sharing of what I do. So that sharing of I of of a piece idea and then creating it mm. and then sharing it back and giving it, you know, uh, that's for me is fantastic. Yes, it's almost like going through the whole art process of the thinking and the sharing and putting it all in a small piece that means a lot. That's mm -hmm. really the feeling it then is always a bit of a, it's, 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 it's always great for fuel uh, to keep you going and keep you motivated and, it's, and, and to inspire you to continue working. There's a, a question I tend to ask everybody on these feature podcasts about, about how they work. Um, and I suppose everybody works differently and, their space and what what their setup is. What what is your setup like? Yes, well, for years my setup has been like running from the kitchen to the garage, <laughs> and <laughs> back and forth, and being distracted by the washing machine. <laughs> but now eventually, I have my workshop out in the garden, and mm. I'm very happy with it. Um, so what you see now is is where I have my jewelry display and and packaging and. Uh, books and things like that but then I have my workshop where I have my heavy duty uh work and also what I uh, I explore a little bit in in the in the in the design of of art um of, of visual art so yeah. from the jewelry um in my workshop I I I can mess a little bit with materials and sometimes I get out my paints and uh, my drawing pad and um, I can just play you know, because I that's actually one thing that I must say that has carried from childhood um, the neatness you know neatness being neat and that's always been at odd with my creative process mm. and now that I have my workshop I can be messy without um, going back to that I should be neater and and that takes sometimes a long time for my process to develop because of the neatness. <laughs> it's so are you wanting to be neat now, now that you have your workshop? Do you want to be neat still? Are you, are you happy to let things go a little astray? Yes. Oh, I can let them go astray um, as long as uh, the silver meeting process doesn't get contaminated. So, so it's a little bit tricky that way, you know? Yeah. Uh, things like dust and... Um, and greet uh, can and and sprays and things like that. They can they can tamper with the soldering processes, and so I have to be a bit careful. But I must say that having a concrete floor where I can just put all my uh, canvases and and just play with elements on it uh, freely, you know, I, all I need is like a sheet of plastic now. <laughs> yes, wow, wow. it's a silly thing. It was my thing, but it's not, you know, in the brain. <laughs> and what are you making now? Yes, um, 
I am working with with the three dimensionality of uh, silver smithing, so shaping the silver, but also the sculpt the sculptural aspect of it, and so I'm trying to bounce back and forth with the idea of art and jewelry, mm. um, more like the creation of pieces with precious metals um, that are also art pieces. So I, I'm exploring um, the framing process, you know, of the art. Yeah. Jewelry. Um, and it's funny because when I say jewelry, sometimes it uh, it seems that it, it, it belongs to another dimension for most people, I guess, jewelry. Mm -hmm. But um, it's all part of the same creative process and about recreating a feeling that one might grasp, you know, like just having one walk or looking at the stones and something I do a lot, walk mm. with me and forever mesmerized with stone and stone shapes and uh, I still collect stones <laughs> that I might carve <laughs> but um, at the same time I see the stones or pebbles and they could be part of a piece mm. I uh, it a bigger piece yeah 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 yes so mm -hmm. yes I I'm still a collector which I inherited from my dad and from all those pieces I'm always developing ideas um mm. And finding a way, perhaps, to to explain the pieces, how they came to be, uh, mm. the importance of their shape, you know, like natural little things, like the most significant, the most insignificant little shells have the most amazing shapes, which are dictated by their function. Yes. And going back to then, shape and function, you know, of artifacts and even jewelry itself, shapes have a lot of meaning. So, um, so, yes, I'm always exploring those avenues, shape, yeah. meaning, function. Well, so I, I'm really intrigued by what you what you were saying there insofar as that the meaning and purpose of shapes. Um, and is there something that, is there a particular type or is it just whatever you can find? Or is it is it you just going out exploring as you, you have been doing all your life, it seems? <laughs> what, yes. <laughs> yeah, is that, is there, is it, have you ever a, a motive that you are in search of? Um, I guess that it's just um, perhaps it's like a um, an intuitive um, feeling of excitement that mm -hmm. that a certain item might just trigger in your brain. So. Uh, and I then wonder, why do we get excited like that, you know, with things? And we have the concept of beauty as humans, yes. but beauty in itself is not a simple concept. Mm. And what we withdraw from beauty and the whole idea of what art is, uh, it really comes from a trigger in the brain that might be, you know, millions of years progressing. Yeah. And... Um, to become that concept, but why does have that big uh, attractiveness? You know, why is it so attractive, and what does it mean then? Uh, so, so yes, a simple walk by the beach, and and perhaps, you know, I find an old item of of like a fisherman boat, which has been completely reshaped by the waves and and banging banging against the rocks and. These shapes are the most amazing things because you 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 feel that all those millions of years of 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 movement and development are are all in one small shape, mm -hmm. and from those shapes, rocks, I don't know, um, twigs, um, pebbles, polished glass, um, all these ideas then search, you yeah. know, to, cre to create something. Perhaps a lie is is never is never my you know I I never search for a piece that I'm gonna make something of it just I just look at these pieces and and I just get so excited <laughs> about yeah. all these processes so it's a process I guess of nature and time yeah and and that and the fact that we are part of it and I guess that the fact that we are part of this process is what 
triggers in our brain that idea of beauty yes or that idea of looking into art as something that gives us something back so from those little moments of inspiration what i hope is to reach that feeling in somebody you know which will bounce back and that yeah. person will get that from the piece oh yeah. that wow moment wow what a, you're you're an inspiration to listen to rosaire <laughs> but well, you just have you have such passion about what you're talking about and about what you make and what you do and it's infectious so <laughs> i'm hoping that it will infect those who listen uh, to to continue to make or to make in the first place and just to, to hear about your your artistic journey is really inspiring. And I hope that um, I hope that everyone else who listens feels the same way. I'm looking forward to sharing a lot more work that you've created uh, through the collective. We've got we've got lots of exciting bits and pieces coming up, which are very, very cool. And we're very excited to share with them and are reflective of what you're talking about there and in your search for exploration, uh, which is which is really, really amazing. Rosera, thank you so much for joining the conversation today um, and uh, and for sharing your story and uh, your inspiration. And, and you are an absolute inspiration to other artists and to, to, to our listeners. And I'm looking forward to sharing this with everybody. So thank you for that. Um, thank you very much. No thank problem. you for listening. <laughs> no problem. And um, we will put all of Rosera's new work on the Newer Collective website at www.newercollective.com and yeah you will find all of her work as well on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and wherever you get your social work from and um, they will be spread across there over the next few weeks so be sure to keep an eye out for that too um, if you enjoyed listening to this podcast remember we have a whole collection of podcasts for you to listen to from other future artists to really exciting conversations that we've had about lots of things such as the environment like Rosary has just spoke to us quite intently about there um, as well as art artivism and um, other kind of interesting topics share this with all of your friends and family and, and we look forward to getting back in touch with you all guys very soon my name is Ava Chalana and you've been listening to the New Collective Podcast Thank you.